now that the uh, newspaper's here. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I'd like to call the regular commission meeting uh, for Tuesday, October the 8th, 2013, to order. If you have a cell phone, please either turn it off or put it on vibrate. The invocation tonight will be by the Reverend Melvin Simpson from the First Church of God in Christ. And if you'll please stay standing, after he is done, we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor. Thank you. If we would, bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for all your many blessings. It was you, Lord, that woke us up this morning, Lord, and we was clothed in our right minds. And, Lord, we ask you tonight, Lord, to bless us, Lord. Bless our city. Bless our land. Bless our country, Lord. Bless each and every one of us, Lord. And, God, keep us, God, in the center of thy will. We thank you, God, for all your goodness and your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, the first thing before we get into the, to the meeting, uh, if you'll notice, I'm wearing pink. This is the first pink I've ever owned. Uh, the firefighters are selling these t-shirts for cancer awareness. And if you would like to buy one, they're 10 bucks. And they look pretty good, you know. Yeah. All right. Uh, consent agenda items. The regular commission meeting minutes from Tuesday, September the 24th, 2013. And a 2013 appropriation ordinance number AO-13-18, the amount of $860,115.67. Commissioners, any questions? None for me. Huh? None. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Motion was made by Commissioner Edwards and seconded by Mayor George to approve the consent agenda as presented. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Castle. Aye. Mayor George. Aye. Commissioner Faulkner. Aye. Commissioner Edwards. Aye. Okay, next item is a, a proclamation. This is something I always love to do. Uh, this proclamation is declared Friday's Purple and Gold Days in support of USD 445 students. Dr. Morton, uh, if you and Trudy and your other guests would like to come up to the podium. Face that way. Get the camera. This proclamation, whereas public schools are the backbone of our community and provide children the education and tools necessary to become productive members of society and Whereas, Coffville schools are committed to providing a happy, caring, hopeful environment which will empower all children to achieve their greatest potential. And whereas, all USD 445 employees work tirelessly to serve our children with care and professionalism. And whereas, the best education for our children is achieved when parents and the community as a whole become involved in the education process. Now, therefore, I, David George, Mayor of the City of Coffville, Kansas, do hereby proclaim Friday, all Fridays, as Purple and Gold Days throughout the community, and do hereby urge all citizens of this community to support our children and our schools, not only on Fridays, but all throughout the year. In witness thereof, I have hereto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Coffville be, to be affixed this eighth day of October 2013. Thank you very much. David. You're welcome. Anything you'd like to say? On behalf of the school district, uh, we'd like to thank the city for this pro proclamation. Uh, it's really great to see uh, entities working together in a positive way that uh, promotes education, and uh, which is a, a driving force in our community. So again, I'd like to thank the mayor and the commissioners for declaring today and, and the team that put it all together. Uh, I know we're missing a couple, which is Misty Russell and uh, Robert Roski were a part of that. And uh, Jim, Jimmy Littleford. And Jimmy Littleford. So uh, on behalf of the school district, we'd like, again, thank you very much for recognizing It was our us. pleasure. It was our pleasure. Thank you. 
And next, we have a presentation from USD 445. And the first part of the presentation uh, is going to be the Imagination Library. <clears throat> Kathy, if you would introduce yourself. Okay. I'm Sue Wajinski. I'm a retired teacher. I taught 41 years, 35 in the Coffeyville School District. And I'm Kathy Schull. I'm a home business specialist with Four County for a federal grant called My Family. And I, we serve the Montgomery County area. And when I was serving independence, I kept signing kids up for this thing called Imagination Library. So through, through further research, I thought our kids in Coffeyville deserve that opportunity too. It was developed by Dolly Parton in 1995 in her home state of Tennessee. And her goal was to encourage children to love of reading and learning, and everybody should have a book. So through her foundation, kids receive a book every month from birth through five. They come like this, and it's addressed to them. So they get their own mail each and every month. So it's kind of fun to go to the post office, get a box, and not have a bill. So the kids get their own book. And Sue's gonna explain a little bit about the books. Now, as an educator, we were always concerned about what books we read to our children, and <clears throat> as parents, I'm sure the same, and the grandparents. Well, when we started looking at this program, we were very interested, I especially was very interested in the way these books were selected. They had a committee of parents and teachers and child development specialists and librarians and publishers, and they not only looked at what a book looks like, which sometimes we buy books because they're pretty and we like think they'll be nice for a child to look at, but they also picked them for the theme that they have or wanted to work on. And a lot of the things were promoting self-confidence and appreciation for diversity, and then an appreciation of art. And because of that, then they chose from that themes, then they started working on developmental stages based on birth, through five years old. So if they were sending a book to a child who is just born, the group one as they would call it, they send books that are full of color, books that are tactical, you can touch them, <laughs> they make sounds perhaps, or you make sounds when you read them to them, the parents do, and books that begin to start a rhyme, a little bit of a rhythm and repetition, so as they're developing their vocabularies they can say the words along with you. Then when they're working on books for the one and two year old, they begin to get into a lot more of the rhyming things, nursery rhymes, things like that, that we would say with our kids too. And colors, start what color is that, numbers, um, shapes. Then as they moved on into the third group, they began to have less words and more pictures in hoping that the children would develop their own imagination and their own stories. Then in the next group, they started working on um, developing the right and wrong problem solution books, those kind of things where you had, what did the character do, why do you think they did it, and maybe solving a problem. They also got into thank you issues, you know, where people thanked, you know. Some of the books tell you that by the title. And then in the last books, they get into real kindergarten readiness, sounds, letters, colors, shapes, and then also into some poetry as well. So they really spent a lot of time selecting these books. They didn't just go to the store and pick up a colorful book and say, this would be a great book to send to a two-year-old. So they spent a lot of time on it. Kathy, yeah. I'll tell you about them. The first book they receive is The Little Engine That Could, and it comes with a personal um, forward by Dolly herself. And then the last book they receive on their fifth birthday is Look Out Kindergarten, Here I Come and it has a letter again from Dolly encouraging them to keep on reading. And uh, we're in the organizing stage, and Sue's gonna touch a little bit about how we need our community to support this. Now, each community is responsible for registering the children, which we will have brochures that look something like this, only they'll be Coffeeville's Imagination Library. And on the very last page of that, there's a registration form that the parents will fill out for every child in their family. So if you have four preschoolers, you'll get four books, you know, because they're all age appropriate and you probably don't have four all the same age, or you hope you don't. And, and so, I mean, it'll be a lot of work, let's face it. So then, then we have the book, after we finish that, then we put the names into the database and the books are ordered and they're sent from the Dollywood Foundation. 
Now, you might wonder what something like this would cost. For a year, for just for a whole year, 12 books, it's $27 per child. For five years, thinking that we start them at birth and go up until their fifth birthday, it's $135. Now, that's a bargain. Any way you look at it, that's a bargain. Now, Dolly was very insistent that parents not have any financial hardship because of this. So it had to be a gift to the child. It has to be free. So we are in, as Kathy said, we're in the developmental stage right now. And obviously, that means we're looking for money. <laughs> so we are going to do a mass mailing, we hope. And we're going to talk with some about ways to do that. We are now meeting with clubs, organizations. But we wanted to be sure that we brought it to the people in the community that need to know, <laughs> you guys, and also to get the word out as best we can. So this seemed like a really good thing. Questions? Questions for us? Do you have any idea how many children do we have in the community between? Well, one we're, and we're really lucky in Coffeeville because we have the Early Learning uh, Center. Right. And so they're, I'm sure Karen's going to tell you this, I think they're 162, 162 children there alone. Okay. So that's a good place to start. We know there are about 140 some kindergartners, I believe. So if we figure that that's how many come into kindergarten each year. Now the kindergartners are too old for it. It stops when you're mm -hmm. five. But you know we're looking at. I don't. Other than that, I don't think we would have any way to know. But we have ideas of where we're going to register them. The early learning center will obviously be a great place. We'll also have registration forms at the elementary school. So when brothers and sisters are registered. Um, we have two, at least two preschools in the community. Um, today, we talked with Rotary at noon, and one of them suggested doctor's offices, pediatricians, obviously a great place. Not sure we thought too much about that. The hospital as well. You know, we know that that's where the babies, that's where we can get them from birth. Um, the only requirement is that they have to live within the USD 445 attendance area, and they have to remain there. <laughs> So if they move out, then they'll have to get into another organization. Our money will fund the Coffeeville children. Kathy, how many how many uh, children participate in this program in Independence? They're up to 400. They've been going for six years. And they 400. Mm -hmm. The first year they had they budgeted for 77. We're anticipating much more than that with the Early Learning Center alone. So, so is this needs based or no? No. Every, okay. every, every child. child. Every child. We're going to do a kickoff on at Spooktacular, mm -hmm. and what better place, right? Where will we find a lot of children? <laughs> <laughs> How does Independence so. fund their program? Oh. They started out just like we are. Yeah. We, we've written some grants, and then they, the community, but now they're self-sufficient. Um, they have enough businesses that donate every year, or and individuals, individuals. <laughs> donate every year, so they don't have to do any more fundraising. That's how they started out. But um, right now, we're halfway there to what we need for our initial start out. So we're, we're really excited about it. Yeah. So. If I could get some, I'd like to do that so I can give it to the Boys and Girls Club kids. Another great place? Yeah. Good idea. Good idea. Thank you. As soon as ours get printed, um, Rick at service office is printing them free of charge for us. So that's another help to get us started. So as soon as we get those, we'll be, we'll be the first one to have some. Any other questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And the other part of our presentation is uh, the USD 445 Early Learning Center, or, yeah. and uh, Karen Lum. Karen, you might turn that mic around so the people at home can hear you. I've got a pretty large voice. I've been in the classroom for a few years, too, besides becoming assistant principal. But um, thank you guys for having me. Um, I am the new assistant principal at the Early Learning Center. That's just a few blocks away here on Walnut. Um, I'm going to wait just a little bit. Okay, 
Well, um, the Dr. Jerry Ham Early Learning Center, as I said, was a few is a few blocks down the way. We serve uh, birth to four and five year olds, um, transitioning them, getting them ready for the kindergarten program. Um, mm -hmm. We've done a lot of research to determine why uh, early childhood education is important. And um, there we go. Feel that um, far too many of our children enter the school not prepared. So. so I'm like unhealthy for me. Um, when unprepared children begin school behind, we know that they tend to stay behind um, and then tend to fall further and further behind. Some of the statistics that we have show that um, children who do not recognize the letters of the alphabet when they enter kindergarten demonstrate significantly, significantly lower reading skills at the end of the first grade. 88 percent of the children who are poor readers in first grade will still be poor readers by the fourth grade. 74% of the children who are poor readers in the third grade remain poor readers when they start high school. So it's a growing trend. It never leaves them. In most cases, it never leaves them. So all children need to enter school ready and able to succeed. Um, children who attend high quality preschool enter kindergarten with better pre-reading skills, richer vocabularies, and stronger basic math skills than those who do not. Um, and as far as a quality education program, I feel our um, faculty is top notch. Coffeyville University uh, Universal Pre-Kindergarten follows high standards of quality, including implementing a state approved, approved curriculum and employing teachers who are state certified in early childhood education. We also boast that every classroom has a lead teacher and also a teaching assistant, providing a seven to one ratio so that we have more opportunities for individualized instruction and attention for each child. Um, the children and the families also benefit at the Early Learning Center. Uh, they receive access to comprehensive services offered through the Head Start, which some, at all times includes health and dental screenings, mental health support, social support, services. Um, we do a lot of early intervention and that seems to pay off. Um, you know, we've already seen a reduction in services at the kindergarten level for special ed services just because we feel like we're meeting the needs at a lower level, getting those students prepared and ready to transition. Um, if you were to walk into our building, you would see family style meals with children and staff eating breakfast and lunch at the same table. Uh, the children are responsible for setting the table, preparing their plate, getting their beverage, and, and cleaning up after themselves, um, practicing good table manners, saying please and thank you, brushing their teeth after all meals. We encourage all these you know, positive behaviors, um, important skills that we feel are um, you know, lifelong skills. We want to make habits that are, are good for the well-rounded child, not just academically. Um, at the learning centers, the children learn problem-solving skills, sharing, taking turns and responsibility. Uh, they also experience food activities uh, where the students are experimenting with taste, smell, touch, hearing and sight. Uh, they practice cutting, counting, following directions, mixing and measuring. Uh, other activities include motor lab to build core muscle strength and agility, and then brain time to support language development, and of course outdoor play and library time. Um, so again, we hope that we're developing uh, the well-rounded child after all these activities. Um, cognitively, uh, these activities show that it improves school performance in the long run, raises math and language abilities, sharpens their thinking and attention skills, uh, reduces the special education placement, such as I spoke of, and lowers the school dropout rates. Socially and emotionally, we help to improve and strengthen interaction with peers, decrease the problem behaviors, uh, encourage more exploratory behavior, and help adjustment to the demands of the formal schooling, talking about kindergarten and all the demands there. So um, currently, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you guys about um, what we have to provide. The grants that the district has received has provided an awesome opportunity for uh, a huge resource, I feel like, for this community. And this year is the first year that we've been able to offer all four-year-olds a place in our school, regardless of income. Uh, and we've actually waived the tuition fees. Um, 
and um, you know ultimately we encourage feedback this year as we try to assess what the community needs truly are uh, we've talked about full day programs and um, you know, again the parents are invited community members are invited to come and check out our location I would love to tour you around and show you uh, what's going on in the classrooms currently and uh, again open it up for feedback so that we can uh, better the population in its entirety. So. Do you guys have any questions for me about the Early Learning Center? Mm -hmm. oh. All right. Thank you, Thank you for Thank your you. time. Yes. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Next item, comments from the public. If, if you'd like to come up and, and speak to the commission, the only request we have is name and uh, address. Anybody want to come up and talk to us? I haven't talked to you for a while. I'm Mary Wilson, live on New Street. I go to church at First Christian, and the intersection at 10th and M has been under reconstruction. So it meant that when I went to church, I had to find a way to leave church, to get there in the first place and then to leave it. It's been a very interesting experience. It is open now, and it is great. It is smooth intersection, and it has a beautiful sidewalk there. I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Anybody else? I don't know where this is where I was supposed to be. No, Jay, Jay, just a second. We're, we'll come to you. This isn't it. No, just a minute. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> Gary Bradley, 606 West 4th. I just want to speak for just a second as a resident of the community, not as the city manager. And what uh, Ms. Lum just said, she did a great job, I think, adapting without her technology playing along with her. But I just would like to reemphasize, you know, I have my own child there. There are a lot of people who have a stigma attached to the early learning center and, and everything that's involved with it. I put my son there because I have confidence in the school system and the school district, and I wanted him to get exposed to uh, education at an early age and, and have the socialization and the things that will prepare him for kindergarten. I'm amazed when I go in there about the, the facility and the staff and how great they are. Our leadership Coffeeville class went there a couple of weeks ago and even the, the folks in that group who don't have kids there were impressed by the motor lab and the different things that the kids do. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity for people to take advantage of um, and I as someone who, who has a child there, I would just encourage anyone who has a child in that three to four year old range to get them involved and get them there. My son comes home every day excited and talking about the things that he learned. Great. So. My kids also went there and uh, I was impressed when they, when they went there just by, the, just by the food they get is very healthy uh, and, and just how well the teachers really worked with parents and everything so I commend you they loved it and they tell me all the time when we pass that building that they, that they want to go back so. well, that's definitely a good compliment when a kid wants to go back to school <laughs> <laughs> all right anybody else we'll move on old business discussion and action to fill an unexpired term for the public library board applicant Jay Shearhart City Manager Cindy Price will make comments. City Clerk. City Clerk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Mayor and Commissioners, uh, at last meeting we discussed the appointment for the Library Board. We do have two openings. We have one application, and Mr. Shearhart uh, is here, and he would like to make some comments regarding his appointment. Great. Jay. I uh, come before you with in humility. I find that this 
operation in this city is great. Uh, so I really appreciate the work, work you gentlemen do. I uh, worked out the refinery for 40 years, and after that, I had to find some part-time to to, uh, work to do, and well, one of the things was with the library board. I would strongly recommend that anybody interested uh, would consider uh, applying for that. Uh, <coughs> I'm about to start a new term myself. <laughs> uh, I, I tell you, I'm at a loss. I, <laughs> I, I, Jay, why would you like to be on the board? I have uh, been a reader all my life. Uh, I had a library card about as quick as I could walk. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I've enjoyed the library since it was over on 8th Street. Uh, it uh, has been source of great pleasure, great education, it, it's, it just does a wonderful job. Okay. Jay, didn't you also do the, haven't you also volunteered at the Dalton Defenders Museum and stuff like that as well? I am still available. Uh, they <laughs> give me a second retirement, <laughs> first from the refinery and the second from that, but uh, they still call me occasionally. <laughs> We appreciate you doing that all those, all those years. It, uh, it was a pleasure for me. That uh, uh, gave me a chance to represent Coffeyville to uh, visitors, to inform them of, uh, uh, I was asked a lot of, in, in addition to uh, the museum contents, I was asked about other things to do in Coffeyville. And uh, I tried to mention everything, the Aviation Museum and everything like that that we have to offer. Any other questions for Jay? I have none. Jay, we sure appreciate you coming up here. Thank you. Move to take from the table action to appoint one person to the library board and to appoint Jay Shearhart to an unexpired term on the public library board serving to April 30th, 2016. I'll make a motion. Second, you mean? Second, second, second sorry. Motion was made by Commissioner Edwards and seconded by Commissioner Kessler to take from the table action to appoint one person to the library board and to appoint Jay Shearhart to an unexpired term on the public library board serving to April 30th, 2016. Commissioner Edwards. Aye. Commissioner Kessler. Aye. Mayor George. Aye. Commissioner Faulkner. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Sherhart. Uh, since I guess he's standing up, he must be ready to come up here. Uh, resolution number R1385, a resolution to execute a construction contract with Huff ceiling or crack ceiling of streets. Public Works Director Chuck Slavely will make comments. Mayor and Commissioners, in September, city staff solicited bids to perform crack ceiling of streets on a per pound basis. The invitation to bid was also sent directly to several contractors that perform crack ceiling type work. Plans were picked up by four potential bidders. When bids were opened on September 27th, two bids were received. Uh, detailed tabulation of the bids received should be attached to my staff report. The low bidder is Huff Ceiling of Albion, Illinois. Huff is a large contractor who's performed projects in seven states over the past few years. The contractor who will actually be doing the work for Huff is Tom Beechner. Tom's company has worked for us in the past, including similar crack ceiling projects in 2011 and 2012 um, as the subcontractor for Huff Ceiling on those projects also. His crews were good to work with. They did a good quality of work, and we were very happy with the jobs they did. Um, the bid will be awarded, and the contractor will be paid based on the unit prices.
times the actual quantity of work performed. The unit bid prices for the largest bid items, which were mobilization and sealing of the smaller cracks, are identical to the unit prices bid and awarded the previous two years. The unit prices for the other line items, which include the concrete joints and larger cracks, was actually considerably lower than the past two years. The project uh, will be paid for from the 70 percent preservation portion of the street sales tax. If the project is going well, we plan to seal the cracks in as many streets as the funds approved by the City Commission will allow. Um, the City of Coffeyville five-year plan for street improvements includes $200,000 each year for crack sealing. This proposed project was bid to utilize the 2013 and 2014 funds budgeted for crack sealing of streets for a total amount of $400,000. The contractor has agreed <coughs> excuse me, has agreed to do as much additional crack sealing as we want at the same per pound cost with no additional mobilization cost. The mobilization cost this year, as it was in each of the previous years, is $50,000. So if the commission were to authorize additional funds to be transferred for an from another source, uh, for, such as the one-time capital improvement funds on an interfund loan or just a transfer, um, and transfer that into the street crack ceiling fund, we could advance one or more future year's projects to this year's contract, thereby saving $50,000 mobilization charge for each year that we were to advance. That $50,000 would pay for approximately 7,150 additional pounds of crack seal material that could be applied to the streets for each year that we would advance. Every block of street has a different number of cracks, different size of cracks, with different width of the streets, varying length of the blocks. So it's not easy to come up with a firm cost per block um, for crack sealing. But based on previous year's crack sealing projects, we estimate that one block of street uses an average of 361 pounds of material or a cost of approximately $2,500 per block. So that equates to an additional 20 blocks of streets crack sealed for each $50,000 mobilization charge that we avoid by advancing the projects. Additional savings would also be realized by eliminating engineering fees for preparation of bidding documents for those future years. And most importantly, sealing the cracks sooner means stopping the damage and deterioration sooner. There are two maps attached to my staff report. The map named Crack Sealing 2013 through 2015 Proposed Streets shows the planned streets to be crack sealed each of those years with a budget of $200,000 each year. If the City Commission authorized, for example, 400,000, oh, just the 400,000 that was the original bid, we can do the streets in red plus the streets in green. If the City Commission authorized an additional $200,000, we could also do the streets in yellow plus about 20 blocks more. Um, the other map shows those same streets plus the streets already crack sealed in 2011 and 12. And as you can see, by that, by that point, almost every street in town will have been crack sealed. Staff is confident that if the City Commission wanted for less than $800,000 total, we could crack seal every rem remaining street in town that needs crack sealed and that hasn't already deteriorated to the point where crack sealing would be a waste of our money. In fact, with that amount, we could probably also include crack sealing the city-owned parking lots in the downtown area to stop their continued deterioration. So I recommend that the City Commission authorize execution of a construction contract with Huff Sealing Incorporated in a total amount not to exceed $400,000 or a larger not to see exceed amount from a transfer or interfund loan of $200,000 to $400,000 as determined and authorized by the City Commission. I'd be happy to answer any questions. No question. Okay. How does this complement or conflict with the efforts of Donaldson? Actually, this needs to be done ahead of Donaldson's projects. 
so we seal the cracks, then Donaldson comes in, and, and the smaller um, alligator cracking, that's where they use their flex scratch, the scratch coat, and then the that, max that, that goes question. over the top. Okay. But, but you need to crack seal those streets before Donaldson okay. does right. their product. Thank you. It. Before we crack seal these streets and, and have Donaldson come in and put their surface. Code, their surface on it, shouldn't we be going through and grinding out the curbs, unburying the curbs, maybe grinding a layer or two off of some of these streets that have been overlaid three and four times? And to some improve, of the, to, and there are intersections to, too that are bad. Excuse me, to improve the drainage. I mean, aren't we, aren't we, I mean, we're, we're going one step beyond putting a Band-Aid on the problem by crack sealing it because we're, we're, we're stopping the bleeding. But to truly fix the streets, shouldn't we be clearing off some of the excess layers of, of blacktop that have been overlaid? We should. On, on, a, on a lot of streets, it's not simply a, a matter of edge milling because when you come to the intersections, if the water's flowing down that street and it's supposed to flow on across that cross street and that cross street's also been raised, then all you've done is moved it to that point and it can't get across the cross street. So then you've got to mill across the cross street and that becomes a wide and you end up doing a whole new swale like we're doing at a lot of streets. Um, some streets, edge milling may be okay, but every street's gonna to have to be evaluated to see um, what can be done. In some cases, you may be better off to leave the street where it is and raise the curbs. That may be cheaper. I than asked several months ago how much it would cost for us to do a, a, a project like that per block. Yes. Have you come up with a number yet? Yeah, I think we gave you that number, didn't we? I don't to, have to it put with new me curbs, tonight. To basically put new curbs? Yeah, we, we had a per foot cost for curbs and, and on average block what that would equate to. Because I, I can get that to you tomorrow. Fixing the driving surface of the tonight. streets is really only half of the solution. The other half of the solution is to is to move the water along the edges Probably. of the streets to the, the water inlets so we can drain it out of the city. And that's what we've been doing with a lot of the intersection <coughs> projects we're doing, which are some of the worst and the flattest sure. in town where the water stands. And those intersection projects are fixing those problems. Is it true that crack sealing a street is only really half of, I mean, you're supposed to crack seal a street and then put some kind of a seal over the top of that, correct? Yes, I mean, we, crack sealing is, is your best bang for the buck. I think right. I think any engineer would tell you that. That but your best you, bang for the buck is get those cracks you're sealed, supposed to stop put, the water from getting under. But you're supposed to put some kind of seal over the top yeah. of that. The crack seal in and of itself is not the finished product, really. No, I mean, if, if your street's still in a good condition and you start to get cracks and you seal those cracks, mm -hmm. then you're in good shape for a while. But eventually you do need to resurface and, and um, the Donaldson product that we're using is good because it doesn't raise the elevation of the street that much, so it doesn't affect the drainage very much at all. Can we have that figure for new curtain? You know, new. Yeah, curtains? I mean, I can email at that out. I think tomorrow, if, okay. if you want. I'm just kind of curious how much that's going to cost and when we can start doing that, because. And we have money in our five-year plan budget each year. I think beginning next year for curb and gutter projects. Well, um, we've buried a lot of curbs and gutters oh yeah. over the years. All over this town. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your predecessor did. Yeah. You didn't do it. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Is there any uh, plan to, uh, as kind of a follow on to Commissioner Edwards' question, as far as milling those intersections where there's uh, severe pushing has already taken place with the existing asphalt? Because it, it appears that if uh, even if you fill the cracks and Donaldson comes back in and puts their overlay, you've still got a washboard at that intersection. Yeah. I think in those cases, to do that properly, you need to tear it out and do at least the swale wherever the pushing is. You can mill, but it's not going to be smooth. You know, you can smooth it out somewhat, but it's it's the the correct solution is to replace it yeah, there those, are there are some intersections, intersections that are pretty bad yeah yeah I, there are i think probably one of uh, several of the most prominent ones i think there's a 
no one would uh, disagree that Fourth uh, Street at a northeast that one going going east is you, probably one of the worst in town, and that'll be completely replaced, of course. That will be replaced, yeah, back to that next cross but there street are other areas, all the way to uh, northeast. The intersection, and it's not really an intersection uh, as such because there's no stop sign there, but going north on Buckeye, uh, when you drop down, uh, Woodland. And turning Woodland. left to go to Woodland. Okay, on Woodland. Breaking I there going down that hill and breaking when it, it's uh, hot in the summertime has resulted in pushing at that location. Uh, I think it's still, it's, it can still be seen at uh, what, was the, what, what was recently done out in Edgewood. Fairway, Midland and Catalpa, we did the entire intersection Okay, uh, there's fairway and Tyler, Tyler, Tyler and Fairway. I think we did a swale. Two out there where it was still pretty bad. There is, there definitely is. I mean, we're we're starting for the first time in my memory working for the city. Though we've got a project, I mean, a system going, and we're starting to pick the worst intersections and replace them one group at a time every year. We've started that process. We're in heading into our third year of that now. Okay. And 10th and Elm that was just spoken about earlier, that was one of those projects. That sure, that does look nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm glad to see that some of the streets south of the uh, highway are getting done, like the state streets and the presidential yeah, streets as well. They definitely need it. And, and if we have enough money for crack sealing, I'm sure some of them will definitely get crack sealed. Those have been, I used to live down there when I was younger, and, and it's been a long time since those have been worked on. Yeah. I'll, I'll move to, unless there's more questions, I'll move to approve resolution R1385 in the amount not to exceed 100000 So I'll you second. just want to do the two years and not advance any other years? We, we're already advancing one year by yeah. combining the two. Doing the so you're changing your recommendation on here? Your recommendation says 400000 Or a larger amount as determined by the city commission. So what is the larger amount? 400, 400, 600, 800, 800. gets everything. I think we could pretty much seal every street in town that hasn't been sealed and that isn't beyond being sealed. And you think it can all be done thousand. this this fall? I think it's contract. I, I talked to that contractor, yeah. Weather's going to move in eventually. He said he would break for the winter when he needed to, but he wouldn't charge an additional mobilization to then come back in the spring when it started to warm up. So essentially, finish. this is going to save us fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. If we go one year, if we go two years, or eight hundred thousand, it's going to save us a hundred. It's not going to save us a hundred thousand. It's going to get get a hundred thousand dollars more streets crack sealed. Okay. But we'll use up to that cap. We won't go over that cap. We may be under that cap. We may we may get all the streets that can be crack sealed done and only be at seven hundred thousand. Right. If that's the I case, will we'll my stop. Motion. Second. It'd be nice to get them all done. 800,000. <laughs> I did. Get them all or get close to all of them. Yep. Yeah. And good. the parking lots, I hope. Yeah. yeah. Let's, get them, let's get them sealed up and save them. Motion was made by Mayor George and seconded by Commissioner Edwards to approve resolution number R 13 85 for adoption. And that would be to authorize uh, hub sealing to do a crack seal project in an amount not to exceed $800,000. Commissioner Edwards. Aye. Commissioner Faulkner. Aye. Mayor George. Aye. Commissioner Kassler. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Thank you. Uh, resolution R1386, a resolution to execute a real estate contract with Christopher and Carolyn, or Catherine, excuse me, for now, Paul. Commissioners, there's an aerial drawing of the area proposed to be sold to Mr. and Mrs. Cornell in your agenda packet. It's approximately seven acres. It's <laughs> outlined in yellow and orange on the aerial. It started out as a, as a uh, request by Mr. Cornell to relocate his driveway because of some things that were happening at the entry point. His existing driveway is shown in blue and the proposed new driveway is shown in yellow or purple, whatever that color is. <laughs> um, and he approached the commission.
commission back in May, you all heard his comments, and I think at that point the discussion evolved into a proposal to sell the property to him, and we decided to do to get an appraisal. There was a little bit of a, a delay in getting the appraisal, but I did talk to the appraiser, who didn't do a formal appraiser, but told me recently that, in her opinion, the the land generally is worth about a thousand dollars an acre. So I. Um, approached Mr. Cornell about that. He was fine with that price. And so we prepared this contract. If you approve it, the next step would be a survey that would be prepared at his cost. And then we'd proceed to closing based on whatever actual amount of acres that we sell at $1,000 an acre. The city doesn't have any real use for this property. It's obviously right there next to um, Roosevelt Trail and the terrain is such that there's not a whole lot of utilitarian value to that land right now. <laughs> is it in the city limits? Yes. Are you sure? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> there's differing opinions. In other words, you I don't know. That don't city know. Limit line goes <laughs> along the section line, which I was just curious if we'd be putting it back on the tax rolls by selling it to him. Well, certainly that would put that seven acres on the tax rolls, whether the city derives any benefit for that. I think what Scott's saying is this the east line or the west line of his property is in the city limits. Yes. Or goes to the city limits. So then we could deduce that this would also be in the city limits. Okay. Yeah. Looks like it from this we do have a map, a street map that is in the packet that you can infer from. Infer is probably a good word. It looks like that area to be sold is within the city limits of this map. I'm also looking at this too, Paul, and it shows that the 5.48 acres in, is in yellow, and then the additional is be an additional 1.5 acre, correct? Yes. Okay. So a total of 6.9 yeah. acres, seven more or less. Any other questions? I'll move to approve resolution dash R13-86. I'll second. second it. Motion was made by Commissioner Kessler and seconded by Commissioner Williams to approve resolution number R-13-86 for adoption. Mayor George. Aye. Commissioner Faulkner. Aye. Commissioner Kessler. Aye. Commissioner Edwards. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. <coughs> Moving on, resolution number R1387, resolution to approve the engineering services agreement with Algier Martin and Associates for the 2014-2015 K-Link project. Engineering Superintendent Scott Massman will make comments. Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. Are you glad I didn't put the project number in there? Yes. <laughs> um, that was a tongue pull. Registered land surveyors, as you know, don't get very excited about too many things. But in this case, this particular project does excite me. Uh, we are going to do a rehab of 11th Street from Walnut uh, all the way to Buckeye and then Nova Chip all the way from Buckeye to East 8th Street, which is a good stretch of road, a very visible road, one that's used by many people every day. It amazes me how much traffic is going on in the middle of an afternoon. It's just remarkable. Uh, this evening, I've asked Michael Atkinson of Algar Martin to talk a little bit about how we're gonna do the dial bar retrofit and how we're gonna do the project in general. This is Michael Atkinson. Good evening, Commission, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Scott, thank you. Uh, just wanted to briefly just take some of your time to talk about what our proposal is on the Kling project. Um, basically, uh, kind of uh, piggybacking a little bit on, on what Mr. Shively was talking about is maintenance. Um, this section of road that Scott was talking about needs a little bit of maintenance. Um, 
Uh, now the, the section that is going between uh, uh, Walnut and 8th Street, uh, that was an award-winning project, received a national award um, because, of the way, uh, because of the way it was rehabbed. Um, unfortunately, that little section of pavement needs to be sealed now. It's, it's time that, that we do something with that. It's performed well in the past and to keep it performing well. It's kind of like changing oil on your car. Uh, we have to go back and now we have to seal it. Um, there's some joints. Uh, you know, the joints in a pavement, uh, unfortunately, they get debris and things, what have you, inside of it. Uh, the, the, the joints are a, uh, a major concern in the design, and, and uh, I know pavements seem rather simple. Um, but when a pavement uh, comes apart, it's generally at the joints. Uh, years ago, when I first started this, about 21 years ago, I had a seasoned inspector tell me one time, he says, if you don't want the pavement to crack, uh, leave it in the truck. So, <laughs> of course, that's impractical when you want to build some pavements. What a pavement, what a concrete pavement will do, it'll crack. No matter what happens, you put it down, it's going to crack. And we quickly figured out as engineers and, uh, that we need to control those cracks. Um, and so typically what we, what we do to control that is we will saw a pavement every 15 feet or so, and then we'll seal that. That's called a crack control joint. Within that crack control joint, um, there are steel dowels. They're, and they're laid horizontally. And what that does is as a wheel load transfers from this panel across the joint to the next, it transfers the wheel load. What happens in that, in that movement is while the pavement is supported vertically, it still has to move horizontally. Temperature and contraction cause that pavement to move. Now, if we go back and overlay that same piece of pavement with asphalt, asphalt is considered a flexible pavement. What will happen at that location? It'll crack. And that's called reflective cracking. Um, so what Scott wanted me to do is, was talk to you a little bit about that. And, and this is how, uh, what I'd like to do is just basically outline an uh, expectation. When we overlay the asphalt or overlay the pavement, it's going to crack at those locations. There's nothing we can really do about it at this time. We have to let it crack. We'll come back later, about a year from now, let that ravel out and come back and crack seal it. And so this is exactly what we did on South Walnut. And, and I know there may be some concerns when somebody says, why are you crack sealing that brand new pavement? That's the dynamics of it. So uh, the section um, going west of Walnut uh, all the way to Buckeye, uh, that section not only needs some, uh, some maintenance, it also needs some rehab. Um, so the plan, so part of this project is to close, perform lane closures, cut out the pavement, the bad sections of the pavement, and go back with new. Uh, the new slabs that we put in, it's a very simple process. Uh, we'll go back and delve our retrofit that. But at the same time, then we'll come back and overlay that. That same crack sealing process will occur there too. So, I thought we delve our retrofitted 11th Street from Buckeye to Walnut back in 1998 when they did the last big project there. Not to my knowledge. We did, in, I was thinking it was more like 95, 96, but yeah, in that time frame. When they went through and they put the drain, and tried to improve the drainage uh, along the yeah, sides, yeah. and yeah. we didn't do a dial bar retrofit then? Double bar retrofit wasn't an option at that time. They, had, they hadn't come up with that idea at that time. Um, and that's been almost 20 years. We did that. What we did was the joints that we had at that time. And that was nowhere near all of the joints. Do you have a time frame of how long this is going to take? Uh, yeah, what, uh, from, uh, let, let me talk about construction and bidding. Um, we would like to move forward with the design. We would, ideally, we would like to uh, move quickly enough where we can get plans, specifications submitted to KDOT immediately. Um, we would like to get authorization to bid sometime this winter. And what that, it does a couple of things. Because of the size of the project, we ex we've expanded it. Um, it makes it more attractive for bigger contractors. Uh, more competition, and by bidding it earlier in the year, contractors can start filling up their uh, their 
their, their agendas. Um, so the hope is is to get more competitive bids. Um, time frame, uh, we would like to start this spring or this coming spring. It will probably take about uh, five months to complete the project. Ma the majority of the summer. Hopefully done in time for fair and rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> well, just for the sake of clar clarity, it'll take about five months and those impro uh, improvements will last how long? Yes, that's, that's a good question. The, uh, the hope is on, on a rehab. Um, it's nothing like something that's brand new. Um, the, uh, the overlay, we expect about seven years out of the overlay. Um, concrete pavements will last much longer if it's just concrete by itself. A brand new concrete pavement, a good example of that would be South Walnut. But um, you couldn't do that in five months? No, no sir. Would we be money ahead long term? Because I, I distinctly remember the discussion back in 95 or 96 that there was not, when that road was constructed, that, that there was a, a poor base under that road. Would we not be better off and money ahead in the medium and long term to literally dig that street out and, and do it right? I think you'd be hard pressed to pry that money out of the state to do that project. Since that is a state highway. I would like to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, a full depth reclamation project, complete removal and replacement. Basically, you're putting back a brand new pavement. Yeah. Um, that is that's a major capital expenditure. Sure. Um, no, we're I know we're talking millions of dollars. Millions of yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, I think Scott and I even talked about South Walnut at the time that we did the Nova Chip, the overlay. We looked at the, that pavement was really in bad shape. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was. You know, we've we've pretty much gone in there and patched, and stitched, and down bar retrofitted, almost all we can do. Yeah. Uh, there's a point there where the pavement, it, it no longer becomes feasible to rehab what you have there. So, uh, yes, yes, sir. That one of these days, uh, that would certainly be something to explore. The South Walnut is a, is a road with a better base, and it, it even though the concrete was in bad shape, especially at the joints, it was still concrete. And this stretch of 11th Street has a, a poor base, and it's a blacktop road. I'm just, I, I've heard discussion off and on at City Hall for years about a full depth replacement project and a widening to have a turn lane in the middle, at least between Buckeye and, and Walnut. And, I, and we always come back to the same conclusion, which is, well, it costs too much. Well, it's always gonna cost too much. And the thing is, every time you kick that ball down, that kick that can down the road, it's going to cost too much more in five or ten more years. And so I'm back to my original question, which is, shouldn't we really be looking at, I mean, we're digging this road out right now of, of a uh, little square section at a time, and we're taking one joint and digging it out and replacing it with a block of concrete and now you got two joints there. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You're doubling the number of joints that you've got. And I just I think at some point we're just we're pushing the snowball down the mountain and it's just gonna at some point we're gonna have to do the right thing. I'm just curious if the point to do something about it really is right now. I'd like to point out that the existing concrete that is there right now mm -hmm. breaks anywhere from six to nine thousand PSI. And the concrete we get nowadays, it'd be hard to see that. Uh, what Scott's trying to say is, is the concrete, the compressive strength, it's very strong right now in, in terms of today's standards. It's, you know, c concrete just continues to harden over time. Sure. Um, and so what he, you know, the, the concrete there is, it, it's a good quality concrete. The other thing to look at is, yeah, it is, it is deteriorating. The joints are coming apart. And I, I would certainly agree with you 100%. One of these days, uh, there's going to be that time where we can't patch the pavement any longer. When that day is, we'll certainly have to take a look at that. That'll be a study that we'll have to do on a, or somebody will have to do on a piece of pavement. 
maybe we start planning. Well, like leaving that. it like it is right now is certainly not an option in my mind. So, I mean, one of the, the, of course, the action that we're doing right now, it's a preventative maintenance. It'll preserve the pavement. And like you said, we kicked the can down the road, but yeah. right now we do, uh, we're addressing an immediate problem that we have right now. We're delaying the inevitable. <laughs> True, but it's up to the state. Yeah. Sure wish they'd get a printing press and start making money. <laughs> At least they're open. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Very good point. Yeah. I'll move to approve resolution R thirteen eighty seven for adoption. Thank you for coming tonight. Second. Thank you. Motion was made by Mayor George and seconded by Commissioner Kassler to approve resolution number R-13-87 for adoption. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Faulkner. Aye. Mayor George. Aye. Commissioner Kassler. Aye. Commissioner Edwards. Aye. Next item, resolution R-13-88, a resolution to issue a purchase order to Midland GSI GIS, excuse me, solutions. Toast the City of Coffeyville GIS system. IT Director Chris Felix will make comments. Mayor, Commissioners, good evening. Um, the City of Coffeyville currently has a GIS website that was built and is being maintained by Midland GIS. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's very professional looking. Um, compared to what they're proposing for their new upgrade. Um, it's bulky, it has some issues. Um, like I said in my staff report, it, it only works on um, silver light enabled devices, so basically um, Windows devices. Um, we can't use it with our tablets, we can't use it with smartphones, any of the stuff that we're actually using today out in the field, it doesn't do us any good. So um, what Midland is proposing is a upgrade to the site. Um, we currently pay $1,000 a year for maintenance on that site now. Um, with this new upgrade, we would be moving to $4,800 per year. Um, they, would, they would host the server now. We currently host it. Um, one of the benefits for them hosting it would be um, quick release of patches, things like that. Um, right now, it's kind of a hassle. Um, so. Um, Yeah, so um, the city is recommending that we move to this new site that would, would enable us to use our GIS platform on um, Windows devices, tablets, handhelds, of uh, things of that nature. So I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you may have. When did we buy what we're using right now? 2010, I believe, late 2010. talk to you after the meeting the current website that already is impractical and not of much use I wouldn't say it's not of much use it's just not practical practical for our uses in the mobile field now we have a lot of people that use it on the desktops don't get me wrong we oh, okay. do All right. but we're, we're moving away from just having desktops and you know we've got laptops it works on those that's fine but the download speeds and everything else with that clunky version it it's really not friendly to use. I would recommend any of the commissioners, if you haven't seen it, you need to go down and see it. And you, so I've, you, I've had Scott and Thomas help me several times, being able to pull something up and they can draw around it and they can tell me where all the utilities are on the lots and everything else. Uh, my only real question to you is, I noticed in here they were going to do a new domain. Is that our domain or is that theirs? It would still be our domain. Okay. It's just they would pro they would provide the SSL certificate for that particular okay. it site. It will be our domain. Yes. Okay. It was going to be a, a gis.coffeeville.com domain, and I didn't want to get locked into them having our domain if, for some reason, we years down the road we walk away. We want to build to that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We we, we will maintain ownership of that domain. Two thousand bucks. Yeah. questions move to approve resolution number r-13-88 for adoption second sure um, name and address 
We're on TV. We got to think of the audience. No problem. Uh, my name is Brian Goff. My address is 1326 Irving. I actually live in Independence. I'm the uh, county appraiser from Montgomery. And uh, oh, you are. Yes. Okay. It's nice uh, to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too, formally. <laughs> uh, we had talked uh, a little bit in terms of combining efforts uh, between the county and the local jurisdiction. I think this is one of the key examples that we can really do. Um, the GIS system that's for Montgomery County, I think can be a dual use in terms of utilizing your information and us combining that information, whether it's a direct site, uh, combining funds in terms of using a uh, provider together or just to even have the same data on the same level. Uh, in terms of zoning, it, it helps us at the appraiser's office if the zoning is concurrent, that we have all the information from all the jurisdictions. Um, and it helps in terms of finance. I know that the GIS system for Montgomery is strapped. They have three people. Uh, and any kind of combination between resources, between your GIS system and ours to uh, combine and make it more efficient and better uh, for not the city but the county I think helps but I would try I would strongly urge to try to combine all of these instead of having everyone separate I, I came from Wichita uh, and Sedgwick County and we'd always have really strong relationships between the city of Wichita and the GIS system we would have access to all the zoning laws everything for Wichita uh, any other cities nothing we couldn't get zoning uh, we couldn't drive a lot of models from what we need for um, addressing property values. And it became a little bit disjointed, having to call Derby or call uh, Rose Hill and say, what, where's your zoning? We have a sale on this property. We don't know if it's commercial property, if it's a residential property. I think that combining as much of this resources as possible is beneficial for everyone involved. Um, and although I haven't been uh, Chris would be the one to contact in terms of the county, uh, would, would definitely advise to kind of bring everybody together and not fraction us apart and having overlapping systems that can't be working together. So this system would not work with what you guys use? I'm not familiar with it one way or another. I'm, I'm not the professional by any stretch of the means uh, on GIS systems. I just know that we run uh, GIS system in concurrence with the information that's provided or that we have for valuation for all the properties in Montgomery, um, but I'm not sure. All, to clarify, all of this is is just the web access to our GIS data. All the data can still be shared, you know, all that kind of stuff. We get stuff from the county all the time. Thomas and Engineering builds layers off of that, and then we just publish to the website. So that's all the website is, is basically just a published version of the data we currently have. Okay. Um, welcome to Montgomery County. The other half. Thank you. Yeah, the, the better half. <laughs> uh, I spent 30 years in the, in the appraisal business. So uh, you have a massive job in front of you. Yes. I have realized that after I signed the dotted line. It's uh, a lot deeper than uh, I thought, but it's worth the challenge, I think. Be gentle with us. No, <laughs> because <laughs> we just try to be fair. He's, Ten he's percent for eighty percent of the time. That's where we're shooting for. No, we don't want to table this. He's just asking if down the road we might be able to share data and stuff like that. So, yeah. absolutely, it still stands. Yeah, still stands. So Thank I'll, you, gentlemen. Just keep those appraisals low. <laughs> uh, Ten percent. That's what we're shooting for. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. I already, I think we, I already. Everybody, it was already moved and seconded. Yeah. Are, are you ready? Yeah. The motion was made by Commissioner Edwards and seconded by Commissioner Faulkner to approve resolution number R-13-88 for adoption. Commissioner Faulkner. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Edwards. Aye. Mayor George. Aye. Commissioner Castle. Aye. Next item. Resolution R-13. 89 a resolution to purchase two mobile hotspots for the GIS handhelds Mayor and commissioners um, Last week I believe it's last week. Yeah last week um, Was it two weeks ago two weeks ago? Sorry two weeks ago staff had gone through a two-day training session for our handhelds We purchased back in June July um, 
now that we actually have gone through the training and are ready to use these, um, one of the requirements is these devices have to have an active internet connection to maintain the level of accuracy that we are going to require to maintain the accuracy that Midland did when they first came in and did all of our, our surveying. So to, to maintain that sub-foot, sub-centimeter in some instances accuracy, these handhelds have to be connected to the internet all the time to talk to the base station we have here on City Hall. Um, we, in town, the internet access isn't going to be much of an issue with the Wi-Fi that we're building out. In the rural areas, we have nothing. So when we're trying to do our sub-foot, sub-centimeter, you know, our, our high accuracy um, point readings out in the country, you need this. we need this. We're not going to be able to do that. We can do it, but it's, we, it's a process called post-processing, but it's a day or two later. So. This, this gets us live, gets us updated in the field. Don't we have, already have hotspots? We do not have hotspots. We have um, USB devices for um, several departments. So um, these, these are actually mobile hotspots that are basically Wi-Fi for the vehicle. All the smartphones that we've bought aren't hotspot enabled? We don't have that option, no. I told you you should have bought Apples. <laughs> I'm not, saying, I'm not saying we cannot right do now. that. We just have not paid for the option with the cell phones we have. And the, the phones that these gentlemen are going to be using out in the field, they're not smartphones. It doesn't cost extra for an Apple. So we, so we don't have hotspots? We do not have hotspots, no. We have USB devices for the USB dongles, basically. So one device only. What is the... What is the difference in the coverage with using Verizon versus U.S. Cellular? Um, it, it varies. Because um, I'll tell you my experience with Verizon out in the county, and it's not very good. <laughs> and we've had similar issues with U.S. Cellular, too, in the county. Really? Mm hmm Wow. Well, but one thing about it, they're not going to be very far from Coffeyville, because the only thing we have in the county would be uh, Lucker like Dust Report. Oh, right. Okay, so right. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, we're not we're not going very so far out. The, so it'd be the electrical plant that really is the ones that'll need these. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Move to approve resolution number R-13-89 for adoption. Second. Motion was made by Commissioner Edwards and seconded by Commissioner Castle to approve resolution number R-13-89 for adoption. Mayor George. Aye. Commissioner Faulkner. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Edwards. Aye. Commissioner Hester. Aye. Comments from commissioners and staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Commissioners. I have two items for your notification. Um, first of all, uh, unfortunately, I regret to uh, inform the Commission that we were uh, denied or not selected for funding for that Safe Routes to uh, School grant. Uh, we were just notified uh, yesterday of that. Um, and so I wanted to um, get your direction on, on how would you like city staff to proceed with, um, with that issue. We've, we discussed that at the end of last meeting and yeah, my understanding was the direction is that if we weren't funded, we would move forward with it. Yep, we'd take care of it ourselves. We, what, we was, what was the proposal that you recommended several months ago? The um, the cost was approximately twenty four thousand dollars for seven um, flashing school zone lights to be installed around Community Elementary and on Eighth Street. And that includes. 8th Street High School, Junior High? That's correct. It'd be two on 8th Street, one east and west uh, of those schools on 8th Street, and then five um, surrounding Community Elementary. Um, there, are all, there are other options. Um, you know, we could do signs with um, feedback devices, basically signs with radar guns in there that, that would show your speed. There's, you know, locations we could um, put those. Um, you know, we could expand this if we wanted to also include 
um, Holy Name School as, as well. So there's, there's a couple different options depending on what scope of project the, the commission would like to see. I think probably if, if we're going to do something for the public schools, I almost feel obligated to do something for Holy Name also. I mean, I think that we should include Holy Name in, in the proposal. I and I know that you odd. worked up a, a wonderful proposal, but it didn't include Holy Name? It, it did not. That, that particular proposal the did not. Kid. Would you have any objections to him working up a different proposal? That no, included no holy name. Yes. What about Let's go the, the early education center? <clears throat> Parents do walk there with their kids. Some of them do. We we actually have had a, um, a proposal to make some improvements around the early um, learning center uh, with regards to the intersections surrounding that. We um, have been staff have been discussing, and it's a little bit premature, but we'll probably be bringing a proposal to add four-way uh, inter stop sign intersections around the early education center um, also Chuck you had uh, the engineering company in to look at replacing part of that street in that area didn't you Holy name. no uh, early Holy education street. yeah the 22nd uh, and 3rd Union Street from 1st Street to 4th Street I don't know if that's we'll begin design hopefully do that construction Design. What do you need design for? We're totally ripping out that. Yeah, they're going to take it all out. Okay. So I hate to put maybe some around there, but well, my my question is, is that after you let's just start off from the beginning, the proposal that includes holy name. Can you have that done in two weeks? Yes. And then once we get that proposal and say we put it on the agenda and we'll have to hear your proposal, put it on the agenda on the next meeting after that, that'll be a month. Who does the work, the city or do we have to hire a contractor or, or what do we do? We can do it either way. Uh, and if your direction tonight were to just move forward and do it, I mean, we know essentially what the costs are we can Expedited. start the process of ordering the, the equipment. The one note that I would say with respect to the early <coughs> at the early learning center is that, that or early childhood education center is that <coughs> while kids do walk to school there, it's not the same as kids walking to school at the elementary school or the junior high. The kids that are walking to that school are walking with the parent um, who has, one would hope, 30 to 40 years experience of working on the place street. before they cross the street. Um, so keep, I would say to keep that in mind with regards to that particular facility. Um, it, it doesn't mean you can't do it. Uh, obviously, if you, if you wanted to, you can, and we can, we can professionally do so that as well. So back to my question, what, what do you prefer, hiring a contractor or, let, or doing it yourself? Um, we don't need you know, We can do it either way. It'll pull people possibly off some other street projects for a time, installing them, but we can do it. Or we could contract it. We could get prices and see which way we want to go, possibly. Um, as far as around our early education center, those are, like Gary said, um, it's kind of a different situation. And those are residential streets, not commercial streets like Pine Road and Hayes Street. So it's a it's a slower traffic. It's, I believe it's already twenty. I, I think it would probably be twenty all the way around. I think you can have that all the time. Has anybody approached the school system about kicking in? Have you met with them, Tony? Uh, initially, I did, and the conversation was to pursue a grant first, and, and then there has not been follow up since then. Would you get back with them and tell them that we didn't get the grant and we would? Appreciate their help. Certainly. Certainly. All right. Yeah, I'm good with that, but we'll, we'll have the proposal in two weeks. Yeah. Okay. But we can have them if they want to kick in money after we yeah, do that. That's be, fine. That'd be great. It'd be a joint Where effort, a community yeah. project. Yeah, that's right. Partnership. Yeah, a partnership. The, uh, the second item I had for the commission tonight, I'm sure you're all aware that uh, the police department has taken possession of a, a BAE came in. Um, the beast vehicle 
um, we, uh, we, we do have it here tonight. It'll be in the North parking lot. And after the meeting, I'd invite the commissioners to come down, um, take a look. And um, if so desired, uh, we'd be happy to give you a ride in the, in the vehicle as well. We don't so. get to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> he told me the mayor does. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor gets up in the turret. Okay. <laughs> you, well, one of you can drive and one of you can hold the big machine gun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mayor and Commissioners, I thought maybe the Chief would have a third thing to mention, but he's left it up to me to give you guys the good news that we're getting a new police dog. Good. Well, don't ask questions about the old one, though. Because um, <laughs> that's the bad news, is this one, again, has not passed the training, so we're moving on with a new dog. Good Lord. Um, on a more positive note, I would just like to say that um, publicly, we had a lot of city employees that were involved with uh, getting downtown ready. You know, there were a lot of people that came to town for Dalton Defender Days. Downtown looked great. Um, the cemeteries, I drove by those, were great. Um, there had been a lot of work that was done uh, in preparing the golf course for any of the reunions that came in, and it was well mowed. There are some, still some issues with greens, but they had done a, a tremendous job of getting the actual fairways and everything taken care of. We've had a ton of water breaks in the last couple of weeks, and our employees have done an excellent job of getting out there and taking care of those. There's, as you know, there have been a ton of street improvements going on, street repairs, street maintenance. They've, they've been able to manage all of that stuff. You, code enforcement, uh, we've torn down more houses in the last couple of weeks than probably any other period uh, this year. Uh, we've got over 25, I think the number was 27, that are in the process right now of going for condemnation. That, as you know, is, is one of the top priorities of the residents uh, that, that they expressed in the survey. The fire department is out there this week doing a lot of education with folks. Um, you know, they're going to the, to the schools and talking to the kids uh, about fire prevention and, and doing the smokehouse. They're out selling the T-shirts uh, and interacting with people, selling, selling food at Dalton Defender Days. The, the police are involved. I just went to McTe McTeacher Night uh, and, and we had a presence up there as well uh, with city employees and interacting with, with kids. This is customer service week, uh, which you know I think staff has done a great job of em embracing a philosophy of providing a higher level of service uh, and being responsible. So I just wanted to take a minute to publicly recognize the employees that have been doing a great job this summer. Um, I also want to let you know that I met with representatives from the school district and the college uh, within the last couple of weeks. A large part of that discussion centered around the stadium and stadium maintenance of the building itself, mostly turf. We've, uh, we're working with them on a request for proposals uh, for turf replacement that fits within our budget. It would be nice to get some of the entities in the community, such as the College Foundation and some of the other folks, to help pay so that that cost isn't split in equal thirds by the city, the college, and the high school, um, or any local businesses if they could you know, try and get naming rights for one of them or something. But they've got to look for other options to try and offset those costs for the city. Um, yesterday I had the opportunity to go to the county commission meeting, and I talked to them as well uh, about opportunities for us to partner together. I talked about you know, working with them on bulk purchasing, buying things that they need, that we need, putting our bid packets together so that we could all save money by buying in bulk. We talked about consolidation of, of you know, one of the things they've been <coughs> talking about lately has been the consolidated 911 center. Let them know that we are open to those discussions. There were no commitments made one way or the other, but we do have a building that's going through a renovation process. We will have facilities available if that was an option that this, the the county and Caney and Independence and others wanted to go in that would provide a higher level of service at a reduced cost to the taxpayers. 
Um, there are other opportunities for us in the county to work together, like the citywide cleanup that's coming up and how we handle household hazardous waste. I think they need to do a little better job of including those funds in the budget because that's a priority for people. If they don't bring it to that event, the only thing they can do is throw it away, dump it in a ditch, or keep it. Um, and none of those are great options. So I'd like to see them step up and help us in our efforts to clean up the community. Would like to also remind you that the cleanup is coming up October 19th. Uh, let all of the community know that. We still need volunteers and we still want people, whoever's able, to bring in their stuff. Uh, anybody that saw it last time, it operated much better than the time before as far as the traffic flow. We didn't have as much volume, but we still had quite a bit and was very successful. We're hoping that with October and what we anticipate to be a, a fairly cool day, that we'll get a lot of traffic through there and help to clean up the town. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, any other staff reports? None? Commissioners? A question. Oh, what is the status of our uh, strategic committees, economic and neighborhood development? Have those sort of faded into the woodwork with the result of the uh, community survey? Those, well, not with the result of the survey, but where they fell apart was my timing of trying to get them done and then rolling into budget season and getting into budget and getting wrapped up. Um, my hope is to get those committees reconvened uh, later this month, probably the last week of the month, uh, to review those plans and then go forward with public hearings. As a recognizing that the uh, community survey uh, addressed many of those same issues, I feel that there's still some uh, viable work that those committees can do. I, I agree. Okay. Can you send us an email with who's on those committees again? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, I have been mulling over something for about a week now. Uh, I would like to host a, uh, a coffee bill city staff that includes fire department police city employees an appreciation meal uh, for them just to show how much we appreciate what they have done this year uh, I'll work out the details and work with uh, city people to uh, get it started but I feel that we need to do this because they work hard and their families have sacrificed some some too as well so I'd like to do that I don't know what else needs done but to do that but Okay. Put together a date and bring it back to us. Uh, Marcus and I talked about this a little bit. My suggestion was the uh, commission be the servers, maybe cook the food, do all that kind of good stuff for our employees. <laughs> Are you uh, sure you want to eat my food? You might ought to reconsider that. <laughs> It'll be foolproof food, not. I, I ain't asked for gourmet meal. Well, maybe we better change it. Yeah, maybe we could have sandwiches. There you go. I, th I thought it was a pretty good idea, Marcus, if you would uh, run with it and maybe talk to Gary and Cindy about it. Okay. If the rest of you approve of it. I'm okay. fine with that. Okay. Anything else? Oh, I did just as a closing. Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Gary, if you would, just as a reminder, I'll be uh, leaving Saturday morning for the League of Kansas Municipalities meeting, and I'd appreciate your input on the uh, policy statement vote. Since I won't be voting for myself, I'll be representing the city. I need to know what your uh, position is, and if you could coordinate between the two of you so that I'm casting a single vote. <laughs> we actually did talk about that yesterday. All right, thank you. Yeah, executive session. Yeah, you got anything you want to say? No, I'm, okay. I'm good. Move to adjourn to executive session for discussion of the acquisition of real estate to reconvene on or before 840 following a 10-minute break. Second.